Hey friend, welcome to the Self-Care Isn't Selfish podcast. I'm your host, Emily Nichols. As a Whole30 certified coach, wife, busy working boy mom, and your self-care guru, I'm here to help you start putting yourself first without the guilt. Each week you'll hear motivating and practical tips on how you can create a habit of self-care through interviews with my amazing guests or quick solo episodes with me. After each episode, you'll walk away with an action plan and feel empowered to implement what you have learned into your life. So grab a cup of coffee, glass of wine, or your favorite sparkling water, and let's do this. Money, 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 money. (laughs) So silly. Oh, but that's just who I am. Hey, gang. Welcome back to the Self Care Isn't Selfish podcast. You're listening to episode 13. We're talking about self care and, like you already guessed, money, managing your finances. Oh, this is such an uncomfortable topic to talk about. And I would have never guessed I would put self-care and money in the same category. But I've learned over the past couple of years just um, really buckling down on my own family's budget and getting more comfortable about talking about money with my husband has been a game changer, not only for us financially, but with our relationship as well. I feel like there's always a saver and a spender in the relationship, and I'm for sure the spender, and my husband is, oh, for sure, (laughs) the saver. And money's emotional. You know, just like I've talked about food is very emotional, money is very emotional as well. And I'm really excited to dig into this conversation because money can be very stressful And that can really lead to physical and mental repercussions if you're constantly stressed out about your finances. So let me tell you a little bit about Mandy Thomas. She is my guest today, and I know you're going to love this conversation and take a lot of great nuggets of wisdom with you. She's an online financial coach, and she has a really interesting story she'll share with us, but her money mindset wasn't the best, and the effects that add that that mindset had on her body was not so great. So it led her down this own journey to change her money mindset, get healthier physically and mentally. And it's led her to helping people see their own finances from a completely different view and how they can be able to improve their physical and mental health by reducing money stressors as well. And, you know, improving your finances isn't just about paying off debt and saving money. It's about your everyday quality of life and really your relationship with yourself. This is a really great time during this interview for me to reflect again on my relationship with money and when I overspend what that is saying about how I'm feeling at that time, which we'll talk a little bit more in the episode. But really taking care of your finances is one of the greatest acts of self-care, but I think it's one of the biggest ones that we don't do. So I hope this episode inspires you to dig in a little bit deeper as far as what your money mindset looks like and how you can improve that. Um, not only for yourself, but within whatever relationship you're in as well. So make sure to stick around to the end of the episode. As you know, I always share my three biggest takeaways so you can start implementing managing your finances into your self-care routine today. Thanks again for listening and enjoy this conversation with Mandy Thomas. Mandy, thank you so much for joining us today on the Self-Care Isn't Selfish podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to have this conversation with you, and I would have never dreamed I would have said I'm so excited to talk about finances, but I think it's a really important conversation to have. But first, before we get started, I ask every single one of my guests, what does self-care mean to you? So Mandy, what does self-care mean to you? So self-care to me, it really means taking care of your mental, your emotional, and your physical health in whatever ways you can do that on a consistent basis. I think going to the spa is amazing, but I think it's more important. Our cups can get drained so quickly and so easily. We need to be replenishing it every single day. So I see self-care as something that you can do as a consistent practice that makes you just feel really calm on the inside, but also at the same time brings you joy in your life, like makes you feel really good. So, you know, after you've really taken care of yourself, you now feel so full and so ready to pour into others. 
Yes, exactly. Exactly. And like you said a couple of times, consistently taking care of yourself and finding those self-care practices that work for you. That's so important. So important. absolutely. So, well, tell everyone a little bit about yourself. What is your story? And kind of tell us a little bit about what you do now. Yes. So I'm an online financial coach. So I help individuals and couples to really get their finances to a place where they feel really, really good about it. They're financially, they're in a much better spot than they were before. And it's reduced their stress significantly. So I never thought that I would be a financial coach ever. My story is we grew up in a family where we didn't really have a lot. And I learned from a really young age that if I wanted to have money for anything, I had to come up with that money myself and I had to really take care of my money. I didn't learn that from my parents, but I learned that I wanted to live a really different life than they did. And so I, from a young age, started managing money really well. I started my first business at age 11 and I became really, really good at saving and managing my money. I went to school to become a power engineer because growing up, my dad was always like, just get a good job. Basically, then you're pretty much set. Like that just solves all the problems that we experienced growing up. So that's what I did. Mm -hmm. And I was doing really, really well financially. I saved over $200,000 by age 26. But the biggest thing for me was, even though I was doing really well on the managing my money, my money mindset was really, really poor. And back then, no one was talking about money whatsoever. And I had a lot of scarcity around it. So even though I had no debt, I was managing it well. It felt like on the inside, I was living a completely different life. And I was super scarce around money. So for me, what happened was it led to really, really high anxiety. And then my anxiety led to binge eating. And then this constant like shame cycle and I felt like I wanted to open up to someone and tell them what I was experiencing. But what I was so scared of was telling the people closest to me and them saying, we wished we had your problems. Like, this is just something that's in your head. And I was very worried that that was probably going to be an honest reaction. So I just kept it in and it bottled up even worse. And I ended up getting very, very sick. I had a lot of actually memory problems and I was 26 years old and I felt like I had early onset Alzheimer's is what I was really worried about. Wow. So I spent a solid few years going from doctor to doctor and then doing a lot of alternative um, health therapies. And I finally realized when I left my career as a power engineer that I really loved, but I went back to school to study holistic nutrition because I thought, you know what, I want to help people through the problems that I have went through. And I was working with a coach at the time. And when I was away at school, what I fell in love with was the aspect of how our mind and body are connected and leading up to this point everything to me was very separate i was a very science-based person and your thoughts really didn't affect your body in this way that's what i had believed leading up to this and when i was at school i realized oh my gosh like all of this stuff that i've been carrying around has just been manifesting on the inside that has caused me all of these issues it wasn't something i was always thinking and it was something externally that happened to me i was always trying to find the cause and I realized the entire time it was all within me. Mm. So when I was away at school, I realized I actually didn't want to help people with nutrition. I wanted to help people with their number one stress in their life, which was for most people, their finances. And it really just hit home for me because when I was working with a coach and I finally opened up to her one day and I said, okay, this is the reason why I'm experiencing anxiety. And I was so scared telling her and she was so amazing. She was the first person I said anything to. And after that, I started to be able to talk more about it. And I was able to make a full recovery of all of the health problems I was experiencing. And then I truly felt like I got a second chance at life because I was so sick leading up to that point. And I realized if this is what happened to me from a perceived financial struggle, I wasn't living paycheck to paycheck. What about people who weren't as good at managing their money? Yeah. What about what they were experiencing? It must be much worse for them. And that's where I realized I needed to help people in a way that other financial professionals weren't helping them. I knew I didn't want to help people with investments and insurances. I wanted to help people with the actual cash flow management of your check has come in. What are you going to do with it now? And how can we really get you ahead financially? And I realized I went through everything I did so I could a talk to people from the emotional standpoint of how it feels. And also 
to help them with the skills that I had developed on my own of the actual managing money and really merging the two of those. And that is what led me here. Oh my gosh. So much to unpack there. It's such, it's, it's so interesting how you feel like you're going down one path and it sounds like you've turned down so many various roads just during your own health journey really and how it led you to be a finance financial coach now I think that's just amazing and like you said you're not just helping them do investments you're helping them with the emotional side of money which just like food food is very emotional for people finances are super emotional as well so you mentioned money mindset a couple of times what does that exactly mean yes so your money mindset it's really the thoughts and the feelings and the words that you use to describe how you feel about money, money in your life, other people in their money. And this is really, really important to see where is your money mindset sitting. For me, for a long, long time, it was on that scarcity that there's never enough. Like I had saved all of that money and I was still living as, I was still worried that I would go back to childhood and wonder, okay, am I gonna have food for school today or am I not? So. Mm-hmm. Whatever your money mindset is, it's so important to know, okay, am I on the end where it's more scarce or more abundant and I feel more safe and secure in my life Mm -hmm. and I feel excited about money or if you feel just constantly worried about money or if you, you know, have really negative thoughts about it. And a lot of times our thoughts and beliefs, they truly are not ours. We think they are. But most of the time, it's from the experiences we had between zero and seven years old. It's the things that, you know, the environments we were in, the things that our parents said, or even maybe it wasn't even what they said, but how you felt. I know that was a big thing growing up was I felt how my parents felt around money. Like it was so heavy. It was looking back now, I didn't realize that I had anxiety around money from a very, very young age. It didn't just start later. It was just, you you didn't even notice it back then. So your money mindset has so much to do with a how it is you keep your money. So how, how you manage your money, because your perception, if you think you're never going to get ahead, you're not going to make decisions that line up with your financial goals and with what you really want. And so it really has so much to do with the life that you want to live and figuring out where that is. Because if someone would ask me even, you know, eight years ago, I would have said, Oh yeah, like I have a great money mindset because I was doing well in my bank account, Mm -hmm. but my money mindset was not doing well at all. So you can, the two situations can be very different. So it's actually so important to see where it is you fall because then you can improve upon that and it will change your entire life, your mental, emotional, physical health. It will change your relationships. Also how you experience the world around you on a daily basis, Mm -hmm. but then also how everyone else experiences you. Because if you feel scarce, which was what my mom felt growing up. She didn't show up as the person she wanted to. And us children experienced her very, very differently. So it's so important to see how, how do you talk about money? How do you feel about it? Mm -hmm. Because it affects every single area of your life. You're exactly right. So what if someone is stuck in a um, money mindset state where they view it like in a scarcity mindset or negatively, how do you help your clients flip that mindset? I would say the very first step is to start with gratitude. So start with recognizing what is amazing in your life. That is what I always talk with my clients because it can be really easy to just focus on the negatives. So if you have food in your house, that is one of the first things because that's going back to our feelings of safety, you know, knowing that we're going to have a meal. Do you have food in a freezer? Do you have a roof over your head? Do you have a vehicle? Is there gas in it? Like all of these things that honestly, after a while, we start to really take for granted in our life. Do we have people that are supporting us, people that, that love us? And sometimes another thing that I will do with my clients as well. So the gratitude is so important and it's not just, okay, this is what I'm grateful for right now, but making that a daily practice because we need to be working on our mindset every single day. So every day, write down five things you're grateful for. And I know when I started that years ago, I thought, boy, it's probably going to be like 10 days and I'm going to run out of stuff. That's what I originally thought. And it's so cool how, you know, I've been doing this for years and every day I can come up with five different things. Yeah. The other thing that I help clients with is that sometimes it might sound counterintuitive, but it can be really helpful is actually going to that worst case scenario. Because a lot of times, 
that's where we went so many times we went down this really long rabbit hole and then that's where we fixated on it and then we just sit there so what i say to my clients is okay what is the worst thing possible that can happen and a lot of times they'll end up saying like i'll end up homeless i won't have anything to eat things like that and then i say okay what are the chances of that actually happening like do you think a family member would let you come and live with them and all of these things that we start talking about and they start to realize hey that story that i've caught myself in, up in so much 99% of the time, those stories that we make up in our heads never end up happening. And it's so good to go to that story and to realize you will still be loved and supported, even at that worst case scenario. And that actually provides a lot of peace. That actually provides like, who like your nervous system can actually calm down a little bit and you can realize, you know what, it can get so much worse and I will still be okay. I will still be okay. So really just the perception of their situation mm -hmm. and really just acknowledging it first. So the first thing I think is, especially as women, we really need to feel like someone's listening and that we're heard. I know that was for me, it was really big because yes, I was a six figure earner, but it, and I really felt like because I did well financially that I shouldn't feel any of this. So then there was the shame, shame spiral there. So the first thing is just feeling heard and then focusing on gratitude, knowing that even if the worst case happens, you'll still be okay from there. Then I find it's a lot easier to open up to now thinking different thoughts and different beliefs and really exploring what you've been through from a curiosity standpoint than a trying to poke, you know, to figure out who is to blame. Is it my parents? Mm. But just coming from, from love. So those are kind of the steps that really help you to start to really shift that mindset. How's that saying go? Oh yeah, all things are possible with coffee and mascara. <laughs> well, that's certainly true for me and I love to have my coffee every morning after my workout and I don't really leave the house without mascara. So my fellow blondies, I know you feel me on this. But gang, check it out. Having my coffee every morning is part of my self-care routine and I always take my coffee blended with nut pods and coconut oil. So Nut Pods is a dairy-free creamer. It's made from a blend of almond butter and coconut cream. I love the French vanilla flavor. It's my favorite. It's super yummy, super smooth, but even better, it's Whole30 approved. So gang, head on over to nutpods.com and use the code EMILYNICHOLS22 to get 15% off your first order of Nut Pods. That's EMILYNICHOLS22, E-M-I-L-Y-N-I-C-H-O-L-S-22. And let me know once you receive your Nut Pods what your favorite flavor is and how you take your coffee. So remember, just head on over to nutpods.com. And you know, like you've already mentioned, there's such a of what like I don't think people realize how strongly your brain and your body are connected like you said you know they felt a sense of peace once they you know thought of the worst case scenario and thought okay if for some reason the worst case scenario happened I could I would be okay can you talk a little bit more because I know you you've had your own health journey and dig into that a little bit deeper about the mind and body connection especially when it comes to finances and how that just really spills over into other areas of your life too in regards to your health. Absolutely. So I'll really speak to the experiences that I've been through. Yeah. So for me, it started off as digestive problems. I had, a, I had really honestly almost all of the digestive problems. Mm -hmm. I kind of went from different one to different one. And I always thought it was something I was eating. There was something externally that was happening. And what I learned through school, which was really fascinating, was when we are trying to push things down and we aren't talking about things, a lot of times that will lead to a lot of digestive issues. And if we're really stressed and tight, those muscles are tight. So maybe going to the bathroom isn't as easy because literally your gastrointestinal system is a muscle. So if you're really tight, which is exactly what I was, well, that's why I experienced that at, at one point in my early 20s. And then there's lots of other areas. So anxiety is a huge one because if you're constantly thinking about the, you know, your worries and the worst case and like oh my gosh like how am I going to pay for this it honestly feels like those thoughts infiltrate and just take over and I experience that very much so mm -hmm. and a lot of times our body tries to protect us it doesn't want us to feel pain and our body is still our our brain is still programmed for when we are experiencing stress it thinks that it's physical stress and most of the time in our life it is now 
mental and emotional stress. Yeah. So it thinks that you actually are being chased from a tiger because of our ancestors. It still reacts the same way, which is to us, it is detrimental to our health because what happens then is it shuts down body parts that it feels like are not vital for your survival. Like it's not thinking about you being able to reproduce a child when it's scared that you're going to be eaten by something. So digestion is one, your hormone function, those start to downgrade. And what it does is it'll push blood to your hands and to your feet. So you can get the heck out of there. And that's where all of a sudden you start to live in kind of fight or flight mode on a daily basis. And back in the day, you would be really happy that you had all that blood to push to those and your blood sugar was being released from your liver and it was going into your bloodstream. And then what would happen was once you got away from that animal that was chasing you, your body would all go back down to normal. Yeah. Well, in the life that we live now, and especially with finances, you're not really ever getting away from that and your body isn't able to go back to normal. So for me, sometimes it might be really high cortisol. Mm -hmm. So then all of a sudden sleep is really difficult. Uh, I did have to take sleeping pills for a while. My sleep was one of the biggest issues that I had and one of the biggest improvements that I'm most proud of. So you can see it in your sleep in either a not being able to fall asleep or not being able to stay asleep. Eating habits are hugely affected. And this is something that I see all the time is when you're struggling with money in whatever aspect, there's a huge correlation to how it is you're choosing to eat yeah. because our body is being sent different hormones and it's just trying to calm you down. So you want that quick dopamine rush, which a lot of times is high carbs. And I can speak to this hundred percent because this is my experience and a experience of a lot of women that I've worked with. Yeah. And sometimes it takes a little bit of time to realize this is what's really happening. Because when I was going through my binge eating, I had no idea that this was the connection until I started journaling. And my coach said, like, figure out what happened right before, like, what was the environment? Who were you around? What were your thoughts? And I started to write them down and realize like, holy cow, this keeps coming back to all of a sudden a thought that came up about money and all of that high stress. Then all of a sudden it starts to really deteriorate your body. Like everything is, is kind of compounding, not very much sleep. Well, then all of a sudden the memory problems, which was for me, um, I described it as brain fog yeah. and it all just really compounds together. And the biggest thing is you can take all the supplements in the world, which I think supplements are great, but I was using them to try and fix something that it was really a band-aid approach. Yeah. I needed to talk about this. I needed to get this off my chest. I really needed to open up and then I needed to talk to the people closest to me. And then I also needed to do a lot of work on realizing the situation I was in right now was not how I grew up. There were very different things. And that no matter what, worst case scenario, I would be in a much better situation than even how I grew up. So everything was still going to be okay. So it does take time to retrain your body. So this is how you have to make it a priority. For me, it was, I, I thought that I was not going to live very long. I was so incredibly sick. I couldn't remember anything. And all I wanted was my health back. That was the reason that I went down the money mindset journey was just because I wanted to feel like a human again. So really just, if you're experiencing any of this, really just dive into it from a love and compassion and a really just wanting to have that zest of your life again. Exactly. Exactly. And it's just crazy how finances can just roll into all these different health problems. And like you said, sometimes you just go to the doctor and they may prescri prescribe you an antidepressant or this pill or that pill or take this supplement and it's just a band aid, and they're not really fixing the issue that what at, what's really at hand. Let's talk about relationships for a second because, um, so I feel like there's always, maybe not always, but there's always like a saver and a spender in a relationship. And I'm just speaking from my own experience. I'm the spender. My husband is the saver. Like he'll, he's saved his Christmas money, like from his grandparents for like five years for <laughs> that something special. And mine's gone by like New Year's day. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, about two and a half years ago, we sat down and we really buckled down on a, on our budget because we wanted to buy, my, buy me a new car. Um, and we saved money so we could pay cash for it because we didn't want a car payment. And it took us a year and we did it and it was so exciting. And then this past year, we've saved money so we could renovate the outside of our house. And through that process, you know, there was some tears on my part and some high stress situations 
conversations because I feel like it's really stressful talking about finances and you almost feel like your guard is up. Like, well, yeah, I went to, you know, express and sent the, spent this money, but I needed a new dress and it made me feel good. And I know for me through that experience, I realized, you know, I was overspending when I was stressed or when I felt like I wanted to impress somebody. And through that experience, I've learned, you know, I don't need to spend that money to feel that way. And it feels better not to have 20 million dresses because that overwhelm in my closet and that clutter made me feel overwhelmed and like my life was cluttered. So it took us a while to figure that out. But I'm wondering if you could speak to a little bit about relationships and finances and how to best communicate with each other in sometimes a high stress situation. Absolutely. So first I want to say it is so common for there to be a saver and a spender in okay. <laughs> most relationships. Yeah. Um, second of all, huge congratulations for you guys sitting down, kind of having some uncomfortable, maybe sometimes awkward conversations. Mm -hmm. And then you being able to achieve the goal of paying for your vehicle in cash. Cause that, that is a huge accomplishment, but then also the freedom on the other side of you guys achieving that and not having that monthly vehicle payment is huge. So I just want to say congratulations. Yeah. That's incredible. Thank you. Um, now what I want to do is I want to just explain a little bit more about how it is that we can communicate a little bit better from coming from a little bit more of a curiosity standpoint and understanding the other person more. So typically when couples fight about money or have disagreements, it's truly not about the money. We really honestly believe it is, but most of the time what it is, is it's about our priorities. So it is so important to realize that. That's the very first thing off the bat to know. So let's say for example, that you and your partner are fighting about money and it comes down to because of one person spending. So that's where you, before getting defensive, because the first thing is a lot of times we're actually not listening we're preparing to say our next thing to defend ourselves. And we really need to take a step back, listen to what they're saying, let them speak first, let them feel like they're hurt, that they are being heard and then respond. Mm -hmm. So a really great question to ask them after they've said, I need you to stop spending money. You can say, okay, tell me why. Why is it that you need me to stop spending money? What will that do for you? And then just stop there and just get really curious where the other person's coming from because they've had very different experiences growing up with money than you have. And throughout, throughout your guys's life, even the two of you together, they've experienced the same situation from a very different perspective. So just get curious and then let them kind of explore where is this coming from? Like maybe it's something that happened between their mother and their father growing up that they seen and it really bothers them and they don't want to bring that into your guys' relationship. So just start to get curious because maybe they have not even dove into any of that themselves at all. So A, it gives them a chance to deepen that awareness. And then it also allows you the chance to understand them from a different perspective because a lot of times we don't talk, we don't even know about our own kind of money history and how that's um, shaped us as a person, let alone our partners and our partner probably doesn't even know it either. So it's actually a great chance to dive deep there together. And at the end of the day, always remember you and your partner are on the same team and remembering that because all of a sudden it can go from, we're being on the same team to we are two completely different individuals who just kind of want to stand our ground. A little bit of pride can come in there mm -hmm. and just remember ask yourself like what would love do now seeing it from that perspective because then maybe your tone will be a little bit different maybe you'll come at it from more curiosity than defensiveness because the second that we start to be defensive and a really great way when you're trying to explain something is to say i feel mm. because you're not saying that you're not saying that the other person did anything or that it's their fault because that's never received well mm. so sometimes just thinking about how how can i bring up how i feel in a way that it would be received well, which sometimes might be writing down, let's say writing something down ahead of time. I know that was how I had to start having those conversations was I had to write things down to get it out of my head because a lot of times we might be scared of the delivery or what we say. So then we just never have the conversation. Then that leads to avoidance. So just work on getting the thoughts down. And even if you have to physically read that letter to them, that is okay. I did that. And that was the safest way for me to start opening up. So really just understanding where it is they may be coming from, allowing them to explore that. 
and then having conversations from there because all of a sudden when they tell you what really is underlying, you might all of a sudden have a completely different perspective and now you're like, okay. The other thing, if you do consider yourself a spender, dive in there and ask yourself, okay, why is it that I find that I'm spending more? Like a lot of times it's, you know, there's an internal need that's not being met, whether it is feelings of safety, communicating something to your partner. A lot of times we're trying to fix something internally by something externally. Mm -hmm. And at first we think that we really do want that thing, but then we get home and we still kind of feel empty. So then that's where we need to explore on our own journey too, to see maybe there's some conversations that need to be had that aren't being had. And sometimes that also might come down to priorities. Maybe there's something really important in your life that no money is going towards that would actually make you feel a lot better if it was. So that's where it's just understanding where you're coming from to where they're coming from. That's the number one thing I would recommend. Absolutely. Well, I know some of our harder conversations, like I said, through a lot of tears on my part, you know, I was having to evaluate why I was spending so much and then, you know, evaluating why I felt the need to do this or buy this. And a lot of times I didn't know why, but then when I kind of finally explained to my husband, I feel like I needed to buy this to do this or do that because, because I felt that way. And then he let me know, hey, well, it feels very, I feel like you're disrespecting me when you're just blowing all of our money, like our family and our goals aren't a priority to you. And when he said that, it was kind of like, oh, you know, like that hit me like a ton of bricks. Like, okay. Because if, he, like you said, if he would have just kept me in like, stop spending money, just stop. I'm like, no, <laughs> I do what I want. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, expressing your feelings and your priorities, I mean, it's so big and it's really a hard conversation. And I know it's for us, it's happened time after time. And I know we're set to go through our budget um, next week because it's the end of the month. And I'm always like, Ugh, but it feels so good when it's done <laughs> and whatnot. So, and speaking of a budget, how would you recommend someone going about creating a budget? Cause I think that sometimes can feel a little overwhelming as well. Absolutely. So typically if there's one person that's in charge of the finances more, I would say for them to really kind of get a really rough outline of it done and then to start just opening up the conversation. And one of the things that I think is really important to take into account. So a lot of people have made a budget before, but a big piece that they're missing, especially when it comes to couples. So it all depends on your specific situation, but let's just say the finances are combined uh, equally for both, like everything's being operated out of one account for both people. What works really, really well is figuring out what amount of money each person can have kind of as their spending money per paycheck. And then from there, you can either, one person can choose to save it for you know something bigger, or you can go ahead and you can use it every single time. But as soon as that amount is decided, there is no judgment whatsoever on what it's spent on. That person gets to choose whatever it is. But I think that's such an important piece that people forget. And also just saying like, you can use this for whatever it is you want to use it for just as long as we stick within this amount. And no judgment at all. But I think that's one of the most important things because then it, it really comes down to priorities because you're each getting money to put toward whatever it is you want. Everything else is being taken care of. You know, your bills are already being paid now kind of extra money, you can choose yourself. So each of you, whatever internally is really important is being met now too. I think that's one of the biggest things that are forgot because you can create a budget. That's great. But this is what's really important when it comes to couples. I'm so glad you said that because I have a budget every month that I just use that money for whatever I want. My husband doesn't even give himself a budget. Like that's how much he doesn't spend money and then saves everything. <laughs> but that gave me such a sense of freedom and that I wasn't like, you know, having to follow rules or be like report to him what I was buying. It was like, it was my money to do whatever I want. So I'm so glad you said that. It's really important. Absolutely. And nobody wants to feel like they're being controlled. Yeah. That, that is not going to lead to a positive outcome for either person. Mm -hmm. So this also really helps to support that, to allow you to feel like you as an individual are being taken care of and respected as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So do you go through like, like we have an Excel document and we have all of our regular bills on there and our mortgage and savings that we do every month too. Would you recommend going along that route or what do you think works best? I do think that using an Excel spreadsheet is the best way versus like, there's a lot of different like budgeting systems. Yeah. 
those are really, I consider them really reactive. They're transactional. They're what's happened in the past. It's really hard to plan anything out in the future using those systems. Yeah. That's why with my clients, I do use like a Google sheet, a spreadsheet, because we can look at this month. We can look at three months from now and six months from now. And that's something that's so important is really preparing for the future because in order to get somewhere really exciting, we have to plan. It's not just going to, we're going to wake up one day and it landed on our doorstep. Like we have to plug in the coordinates of that to get to that location, which means we're going to need to use a spreadsheet or some sort of system that is a very proactive system. So I'm a huge, huge fan of using spreadsheets. That's great. Yeah, we like when we were going to buy my car and it was a used new to me car, but it wasn't super used. But, you know, we planned, OK, we want to get to this amount in our savings because we had a rough estimate how much that would cost. That way we wouldn't dip under a certain amount in our savings as well. But if we had just said like, oh, we're going to save X amount of dollars and then not really look at our accounts or really, you know, have that accountability of seeing where our money is being spent and how much we're saving. I don't think we could have done it for sure. We couldn't, you have to have that data and that tracking to see where you're going and where you've been. Absolutely. There's the one aspect of creating the budget. I call them cash flow management plans because that's really what we're doing and we're not just doing the monthly, but that's the thing you need to constantly be checking in because you can write down numbers and they can be completely different what you've actually done in real life. And you can keep creating that and you're not getting anywhere. So it's that constant checking in, changing things. Also, there's going to be a lot of different things that are coming up in your life. You need to make sure that those are taken into account. And now that this thing happened, okay, where can we maybe shift to make it so we can still hit that goal in time? Okay. So we might have to move a few things around for this month or for the next couple of months, but unless you checked in, you would have had no idea and it can maybe, you might not ever achieve that goal then. Yeah, you're exactly right. Okay. This was a really good conversation and I think it's something that people are really uncomfortable about talking about. But I think if you're coming from a place of love and, you know, giving yourself grace and being willing to change your money mindset and, you know, think about how when you have your finances in order and know where you're going, how that just really impacts your mindset and your health all overall in general. I mean, this is just super important. I think it's a conversation we could keep having. I should bring my husband on the show because he could have a lot to say. <laughs> Um, but Mandy, can you tell everyone where they can find you, what your services are, anything fun you have coming up? Absolutely. So the place that I love to be the most is on Instagram mm -hmm. and I share a lot on my Instagram stories there. So I'm at Mandy Thomas and Mandy is actually with two Y's. So join me on there. And I would love if you would send both of us a message as to what your biggest takeaway was during this episode, that would make my heart so happy. So you can join me there and you can send me a message to find out about my financial coaching services. I work one-on-one -on -one with you. It's very confidential and it's really based around the goals that you have. And we reverse engineer that and really help you to get ahead financially. And for me, it's not just about paying off debt and saving money. Yes, that's amazing. But it's really just about making your every, everyday quality of life better. You having more energy, you feeling more excited, less stress. That's what would make me so happy is to see you to be able to achieve that. Exactly. Exactly. So having finances as part of your self-care is not so scary anymore. <laughs> Thanks no, so much, Mandy. I so appreciate it. I'll include links in the show notes so everyone's able to connect with you. And thank you again so much. Such an important conversation. Thank you for having me. Awesome. I really hope you enjoyed this conversation with Mandy Thomas as much as I did. Like I said, I never thought I would have interviewed someone talking about money, but over the past two years, my money mindset has shifted, and that's a big part thanks to my husband, but um, it's been a new habit I've had to form over time, and really, it's helped alleviate a lot of stress in my life. So thank you, Mandy, for this important conversation. So let's talk about my three biggest takeaways. Number one is your money mindset. What does that look like to you? you know, how do you view money? How does it make you feel? I know it can be very emotional at times. You know, How do you talk about it? Are you coming from a scarcity mindset or a mindset of abundance? All of these can spill over into other areas of your life, like Mandy had mentioned. And 
She also had some great tips to kind of get your money mindset down the right path, such as focusing on gratitude and even thinking about, okay, if the worst case scenario would happen, what would that look like? And most most times those worst case scenarios won't happen. And if they did, you would still be okay. Number two, money is high stress. Yeah, it's very, very stressful. And there is such a connection with your brain to your body. And we're going to get into this in a future episode coming up later this month because I think this is such an interesting topic. But like she mentioned, she was under such high stress that she was having digestion problems. She was having sleep problems, which led to brain fog. And then her eating habits, she wasn't making the best choices for her and just feeling like crud, you know, pretty much. And it was really interesting. You know, she started out a path to become a holistic health coach and come to realize all of her health problems were coming down to her relationship with money. So think about your relationship with money and maybe that is causing some of the stressors in your life. You know, maybe you are, you, you do feel like, you know, you're eating well or you do feel like you're trying to work out, but it's still, there's still something in your life causing stress and holding on to something like that as far as money stressors can really lead to negative impacts. So think of ways to talk about that money, get that money mindset right, like I already talked about, so you can help reduce reduce that physical stress in your life as well. And lastly, one of my favorite tips was just all about communication with your partner um, about money. I know it's hard, guys. I know it's really, really hard. I still sometimes have tears when we do our monthly budget, and I think we have both have done a really great job, my husband and I, of reframing the way we talk about money to each other. Um, you know, me having a budget every month to spend whatever I want is really helpful. I don't ever want it to feel like, and I know he doesn't either, that he's in control of our money or that he's saying I can or cannot do something. I don't like the way that feels, and I know he doesn't want to be that way as well. So, Like I mentioned in the episode, you know, I let him know a lot of times when I'm stressed out, I overspend. I like to buy clothes because I think if I look good, I'll feel better, which sometimes help, but really that's kind of just a Band-Aid. And, you know, he let me know that when I just blow all of our money on stupid stuff, (laughs) pretty much, it makes him feel disrespected. So really keep that line of communication open and it's going to take time for these budget (laughs) conversations to get comfortable. I'm still uncomfortable with it two years later after buying our car and we just went through our home renovation. And, you know, my husband's, oh, he's so good at saving money, you guys. He's so good. And I'm so good at spending it. But it's really helped our relationship improve. And that was the one area I feel like we needed the most Um, improvement on the one area we were most challenged in was just communicating about money and getting a budget under control and seeing it on on paper or on an Excel document has really helped open my eyes and really helped us keep the line of communication open every month, you know, for our monthly budget meeting. And as much as I don't look forward to it, I know it's a necessity. So gang, thanks again for listening. I hope you have even more takeaways than what I just listed here for you during this episode. Mandy has a lot more tips to offer you. And if you want to work with her as your online financial coach, head over to my show notes so you can get linked up with her and her Instagram. And don't forget to leave a rating and review in iTunes. It makes it so much easier for people to find this podcast. And take a screenshot. Like Mandy said, let us know your biggest takeaways from today's episode. Give her a tag and me at Emily Nichols Tutu or at Self Care Isn't Selfish Podcast. So thanks again, Mandy. This was a great conversation and an important, sometimes uncomfortable conversation, but I hope it makes you feel more open to discussing money and realizing that when you get control of your finances, that is one of the greatest gifts you can give to yourself as far as your version of self-care. Thanks again for listening, gang. And remember, self-care isn't selfish. Selfish.